So the Republic of South Africa has 11 official languages. That is a lot of languages. And even though the country is roughly the size of Germany, France and the UK combined, it only has a quarter of the number of inhabitants. And unlike South Africa, each of those highly developed countries have only a singular official language, with at best token recognition of minority languages. South Africa is at the same time highly developed and abysmally poor. So how does it manage servicing all these required language facilities? Well, truth be told, meh, not terrible, but not that excessively good either. Having to spend money and time on translations of official and legal documents, on education, even just on things like road signs, is a bit of a drag on society. But how did South Africa end up in this situation and how could they have made life easier for themselves at an earlier stage, according to South Africans themselves? So how did the Republic of South Africa end up in this situation? Well, you probably heard of this thing called apartheid, which basically meant that the white minority wanted the country for themselves. But at the same time, they wanted to continue to depend on blacks as a cheap labor force. So they basically wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Of course, that worked out really well. But how did they even try to make this work? Well, using a nifty three-step plan. Phase one, deny all blacks their South African citizenship. Phase two, divide and rule. First fragment the black majority into tiny bits. Then create semi-independent homelands for each ethnicity. Here blacks could live at close range for commuting to work inside South Africa and at the same time officially reside outside of South Africa. Phase 3. Profit. South African whites consist of two main groups based on native language. English and Afrikaans. The latter derived from Dutch. And in former minority rule South Africa, these were therefore the official languages. However, the black majority spoke a whole range of different languages natively. To be able to service both white minorities, it was decided in 1974 to split language education for blacks into two, forcing one half to learn Afrikaans. And that didn't go down very well. Long story short, in 1994 apartheid was abolished and South Africa became fully democratic. To honor the different language communities having been oppressed for so long, official status was granted to almost all of them. So here we are now. But why does South Africa have so many languages to begin with? Well, Africa is generally pretty diverse already when it comes to peoples, cultures and languages. South Africa, on the other hand, is actually pretty much comparable to Europe in that respect. But where European peoples have been grouped together into several unifying nation-states, black South Africans have remained fragmented up to this day. And what certainly didn't help was a swarm of independent German, French and English missionaries back in the day, each translating the Bible into the different tribal languages they encountered. This fragmentation was then enshrined later by the apartheid homelands. So when the end of apartheid was imminent, the need for rebuilding the country led some to revive ideas of language harmonization. Language harmonization is fusing several languages together into a single language. This can be done by choosing the most neutral dialect or by creating a novel standard language altogether. For this to work, the languages to be harmonized must be number one, closely related and number two, highly mutually intelligible. This works in many places around the world, like in Europe, where it arose almost naturally with the emergence of nation states. In South Africa, some people wanted to achieve something similar. Black South African scholar Jacob Ndlapo already suggested as early as 1944 to harmonize South African Bantu languages following the two main language families. Nguni, 
making up Zulu, Osa, Swati and Ndebelem, and Sututswana, consisting of Tswana, Pedi and Sutu, among other dialects. This was followed up by other scholars suggesting a regional language model as used in Belgium, Switzerland and Canada. South Africa would then end up with just four official languages, each with their own region. Large metropolitan areas would service all four languages. There would be a language region for Nguni, a language region for Unified Sutu, and a language region for Afrikaans. English would be established as the overarching national language. Ideas like this are regularly brought up, but just as quickly shut down again. Given the history of the country, people are a little sensitive when it comes to being told what languages they have to learn. And there is of course the issue of self-identification and linguistic nationalism. As the old adage goes, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. But it would be more precise to say a language is a dialect with a nation and a history. Only a century of separate yet eventful history prompted the Afrikaner nation to create their own language standard based on what used to be known as African Dutch or Afrikaans Hollands. In contrast, the Flemish, though having become a distinct people too in their own right, opted for and stayed loyal to the same language standard as the Dutch. But ethnic pride aside, are there any technical hurdles for harmonizing those languages? How could this work for the South African Bantu languages, according to the scholars who study this question? Let's take a look at the Sutu Tswana languages. One important first step is making sure the spelling rules are the same. The 19th century missionaries with their different cultural backgrounds came up with different ways to transcribe the same sounds. For example, the word for money in Sutu Tswana languages, chelete, would be written like this. The ch sound can thus be spelled as ch, as tjh, or ts with karen h. The proposal for harmonizing this in so called unified Sutu is simply tsh. And this is just one example. The second step is selecting the most common or universally understood words and expressions to be included in the harmonized language. Pronunciation is less important, as the existence of different accents is pretty normal for most languages. Finally, any harmonized language should be put to the test to see if it works at all. And that's exactly what they did. In a 2009 study by Lakheti Makalela, native speakers of Sepedi, Setswana and Sesutu were tested for their understanding of texts written in the respective language varieties. They were also asked to read a text in Unified Sutu. The results? The students had little to no problems reading and understanding the different texts. In other words, these varieties should probably be regarded as part of the same language. And a harmonized variety seems to work fine for well-educated young people in any case. The results may vary for Nguni languages like Nwasa and Zulu, but it could still work. After all, it does for languages that include much greater variety, like German or French. So will it eventually happen? Well, politicians would probably not want to tackle this sensitive issue. The most likely thing to happen is English eventually being declared the single national language, like they for example did in Namibia already. It seems like many South Africans would actually prefer that. However, this could mean that all the other languages may eventually disappear, and that would be a shame. Had South Africa's past been different and had the country granted human rights for all its inhabitants, like happened in Western countries, it may have been a different story. Check out my video speculating on what could have happened had apartheid never been implemented. For now, cheers and bye bye.